Good day gentle people, it's your favorite Mr. 42. Welcome back to the channel. For this episode, I have been to dark places, but I managed to find some real derp. Let's get enlightened. CC is still confused. Let's see where he wandered off to today. Yeah, the scenario that we we grew up with is Australia is underneath us, okay, or in an, underneath me, and wherever you may be, it's underneath you. And at the same time, we are all underneath Australia. Well, not really, but you still have a problem with the concept of down. And all of this gravity is holding up the water on some sort of planet. Planet. Gravity is holding everything together and down to Earth. But like I said, you still don't get it. Get it. Isn't that amazing? We have no idea what gravity is. Have you ever been explaining gravity? Gravity is the result of curvature of space-time caused by objects. Gravity. You see, us flat earthers love gravity. Because there's no explanation for it. Gravity is the result of curvature of space-time caused by objects. It's complete nonsense. The reason why I love gravity, because you scientists can't explain it to us. It has been tried. Evidently, you are not intelligent enough. When I was a globetard, one of the first videos that I was brought up to uh, to see on Flat Earth was this disc in space. Well, you see, when, when you are a Flat Earther, you understand space does not exist at all. I'm sorry, Chris. Reality does not agree with you. At all. It's gone. There is no space. And so you're such a, an authoritative figure that are telling me that space does not exist? Yes, I am, because I'm a flat earther. You are free to have your own opinion, of course. But if a scientist and you are on opposite sides, I surely know who I'm siding with. Because there's not a single scientist that can tell me that I'm wrong. I'm just gonna read this comment under his own video. It's amazing watching someone publicly confess his ignorance and refusal to learn. Chris's lack of understanding of science isn't evidence against it, but he believes it is. Touché. Yes, that is a good comment indeed. Prove to me that we're moving. A 15 degree per hour drift. Thanks, Bob. Prove to me that the planet is holding up all of this water on a sphere, on a ball. Prove it. But they can't. I just did, but you're looking the other way. Pay attention, Chris. Thank you for subbing and thank you for viewing my videos and let me be a part of your life. Well, that ended kind of wobbly. Let's see who else we have. In the heliocentric model of the cosmos, the moon revolves around the Earth 13 times per year, traveling at 2,288 miles per hour. That, of course, is Eric de Bay. He is here today to misinform you about orbits. While the Earth revolves around the sun once per year, traveling at 67,000 miles per hour. I think we all know where this is going. He is using the big numbers to confuse his audience. The following model and animation illustrate how this is supposed to occur. As you can see, since the moon is revolving around the earth, which itself is revolving around the sun, in order to maintain its regular orbit, the moon would have to be constantly and drastically changing its speed in ways completely unaccounted for by the model. Unaccounted for, you say? We'll see about that. In the outer part of its orbit, the moon would have to speed up 67,000 miles per hour, in addition to its regular speed of 2,288 miles per hour, 
just to keep up with the Earth. Not that it matters much, but you are 600 miles per hour off on screen. So the moon would then be traveling at 69,288 miles per hour when it reached the front of the Earth. Please hurry up, we don't have all day. At this point, since the moon is allegedly 240,000 miles away from the Earth, the Earth would catch up in just four hours, so the moon must continue traveling 67,000 miles per hour along Earth's trajectory while simultaneously continuing its now perpendicular 2,288 mile per hour second trajectory. Eric clearly understands orbits, while completely not understanding orbits at the same time. Weird. Then, as it turns to reach the inner part of its orbit, the moon must now slow back down to its original speed, allowing the Earth to pass by. Lastly, as it passes behind the Earth, the moon must once again quickly accelerate back up to nearly 70,000 miles per hour before getting left in the dust. Enough with this. All those big numbers are really meaningless. After a quick calculation with 2,288 miles per hour and a radius of 240,000 miles, the result is an acceleration of 0.00028 g. In addition to all of this, the Sun itself is allegedly orbiting the Milky Way galaxy at 448,000 miles per hour, further compounding the problems and calculations of the heliocentric model. I have to ignore this one. My calculator doesn't even have enough decimal places to calculate the g-forces involved with this orbit. That's how small it is. If this were true, then the Earth, Moon, and other planets would all have yet another set of ridiculous and impossible corkscrewing accelerations and decelerations necessary just to keep up with the Sun. The forces are ridiculously small. That is why you have to use the big numbers. Got a lie to flurf. And for the cherry on top, all of these calculations have been assuming perfectly circular orbits. What calculations? You haven't done any. I'll do another one for you. The Earth moves at 67,000 miles per hour with a radius of 91.4 million miles. This is an acceleration of 0.00062 g. But the actual heliocentric model claims that the moon's orbit around the Earth, the Earth's orbit around the Sun, and the Sun's orbit around the Milky Way are all elliptical, not circular, meaning there would be even more additional accelerations and decelerations to calculate depending where each one is along its elliptical path. Absolutely true in a way, but negligible for the numbers I'm giving you today. These constant and drastic accelerations and decelerations necessitated by the heliocentric model are rarely, if ever, mentioned by globe believers. I'll be generous and add up those previous values, so we have a total of 0.0009 g. This equals going from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 50.6 minutes. For comparison, a carousel with a radius of 3 feet going 9 miles per hour has an acceleration of 1.65 g. Because they have always been taught that the reason we do not feel or experience any of this supposed motion is because we always travel at a constant velocity. Ah, this image again. It's very misleading. Allow me to update it with the forces involved. There. Suddenly it all makes sense, doesn't it? In their own model, however, due to their elliptical orbits and revolving around other revolving bodies, the Moon, Sun, Earth, and other planets could not maintain constant velocities, and would instead be regularly accelerating and decelerating. And they do. They all do. But the forces involved are so small, you wouldn't feel it. That's what she said. Yet, meanwhile, you can stack a house of cards, make a rock cairn, or play a game of Jenga, all without any of this motion, acceleration, and deceleration ever being felt or experienced. I'm pretty sure Eric will just ignore the g-forces calculated and will use the big numbers instead. That's just how it is. For the finale, I just want to show this clip I fished up from Twitter. Thank you, flurfs are idiots.
If any flurf want to explain how this is supposed to work on a flat disc, please do so in the comments. And with that I end this episode. Please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already and in the description you'll find links to follow me around and drop me a few pennies. This has been Mr. 482, out. Don't panic.